Thank you, George. I uh, greatly appreciate uh, having been named the honorary president of this symposium. Greece brings a lot of things to the world. One of the things it brings to the world is the Olympics. Uh, we celebrate the Olympics twice a year, Summer Olympics and Winter Olympics, but the Olympics originated here in Greece and it's a uh, tribute to fitness, to training, to resilience, uh, and everybody enjoys the Olympics um, as a great feat uh, of uh, those athletes who perform uh, their function for the world. The second thing, uh, or maybe even more important for us, that Greece brings to the world is knowledge and education. We go back to Socrates, Plato, Maimonides. Uh, these were great philosophers who brought and shared their knowledge with the world early on. I have just come from uh, the graduation ceremonies at my medical school in New York, where we administered the oath of Hippocrates uh, to our graduating students, as is done throughout the world. Um, so. Uh, Greece has brought many things to us. But one of the things that uh, is important is the spread of knowledge. And this symposium is a tribute to Dr. Katragadakis, who has brought this symposium to us for the second time. Dr. Katragadakis has single-handedly brought this group of uh, excellent uh, gastroenterologists this is a group that I rarely see together, and this is probably the greatest concentration of talent in gastroenterology that anybody has seen. So I think that uh, we owe a great tribute to uh, Dr. Katsagradakis for bringing us this uh, symposium. Everywhere I go in the world, I see Dr. Katsagradakis. He's at every conference, at every symposium, and he's always accompanied by his lovely and talented wife, uh, Nellie Raptus. But uh, this symposium is a tribute to Dr. Katsagradakis sharing his knowledge and his ability to gather a group of gastroenterologists like this uh, to share our knowledge with you. So Dr. Katsagradakis, thank you for this symposium. But now I'd like to talk to you about uh, the global elimination of colorectal cancer and is it a possibility. Um, I think that uh, if you look at the cover of Newsweek uh, that was in, uh, in uh, March of this year, it says solving cancer. You can't cure what you don't understand. So I think uh, the basically we have to try to understand what's going on with colon cancer. If we look at the colon, um, and this is the cecum at the, uh, at the left, at the large bowel, and if we look at the surface, actually the surface isn't smooth. The surface is indented with lots of little holes, and those holes are the opening of the crypts of the colon. So these are important because uh, if we look at histologically, there are multiple, multiple cells that go into making each one of these crypts. And the fact is that the inner lining of the colon has over a million crypts. One crypt has over a thousand cells. And the entire lining is replaced every three days. Now when you think of a billion cells being replaced every three days, all you need is a few changes in the DNA sequence in the, in the uh, formation of these cells to make an abnormality that may grow into a cancer. The growth phase is actually at the base of these cells. And if you look at the basal cell layer here, the growth phase is down here, and the cells migrate up toward the top and are shed every three days when they get to the top of the crypts. The fact is that if those, shells, those cells are not shed when they reach the top of the crypts, they can stay here and then one cell develops into two cells, four cells, eight cells, and they 
grow and grow into a polyp and then gradually grow into a, uh, a malignancy. The fact is that we need at least five genetic faults for colon cancer and we don't know whether the abnormality begins here at the base of the crypts or somewhere up in here or is the abnormality a loss of the normal apoptosis or loss of cells at the top of the crypts. We don't understand that but we do know that there are multiple faults that have to be um, put together for the development of colon cancer. In the United States, colon cancer is the number two cancer killer and it strikes one out of every 20 persons in the United States will get colon cancer in their lifetime. That's a huge number of patients, uh, persons at risk. And men and women are both at equal risk. We think the risk factors may be smoking, um, red meat, uh, excess body weight, lack of energy, lack of exercise. And we think that colon cancer screening should begin at age 50 in the United States. And those with a family history are especially at risk for developing colon cancer. But what about the top cause of, co of death here in Greece? If we look at the, at the 20 most common causes for death in Greece, we see that colon cancer is down here as number six. But if we look at just cancers, look at this. Lung cancer is number one. Breast cancer is number two. Colorectal cancer is number three. Leukemia, liver cancer, stomach cancer. GI cancers constitute a tremendous cause for cancer here in Greece. And the fact is that colorectal cancer is an important cancer here in Greece as it is in the rest of the world. Is it possible to prevent any cancer in humans? Well, we can't prevent breast cancer, we can't prevent prostate cancer. Maybe we can prevent lung cancer by abolishing smoking. We can't prevent it, but we can certainly cut it down. We can't prevent bone cancer, blood cancer, can we prevent colon cancer? It's the only one that says yes. We can prevent colon cancer. Can it be eliminated? Well, only two cancers have a precancerous phase. One is colon cancer and the other is cervix cancer. And as all of you know, that cervical cancer, the screening for cervical cancer was developed by Dr. Papanicolaou, a Greek physician, and everybody used the Papanicolaou stain now for screening for cancer of the, uh, of the cervix. Both of these cancers respond to screening tests. Now we think that perhaps 40% or more of people we can prevent colon cancer by having regular colonoscopies because we can remove precancerous polyps before carcinoma starts. And we also think there's a long lag phase from the development of a polyp to progression of polyps to carcinoma. What about prevention of colon polyps from developing? Well, we think that maybe fiber, exercise, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs may decrease the incidence of uh, colon cancer and uh, colon polyps. And we think that perhaps there, we can increase the incidence by, uh, by a high meat intake Obesity may increase the incidence as may physical inactivity. But what about the removal of colon polyps? We think they can prevent 90% of colon cancer by removing colon polyps. And how do we know if colon polyps are present? The fact is that we don't know. Uh, there's only one bit of the history that will tell us that uh, the person may have an increased risk for colon cancer, and that is the family history. So genetics are important for the development of colon cancer, but most of the time you can't tell who has polyps and who doesn't have polyps. But can polyp be prevented? There are no studies to really show that diet makes a difference, that exercise makes a difference, or medication makes a difference. So the fact is that we don't know how to prevent colon polyps. We do know, however, that one of the most powerful weapons in preventing colon cancer is regular screening. Screening can prevent colon cancer 
by removing colon polyps before they turn into cancer. And screening can also find colon carcinoma when it's early and highly curable. But if we look at the screening strategies, the main screening strategy in the United States is colonoscopy. What else can we do? Colonoscopy affords screening, diagnosis, and treatment, but other screening tests are computerized tomographic colonography, the flexible sigmoidoscopy, fecal cup blood tests or the uh, fecal immunochemical test or stool DNA. If any of these are positive, the steps lead to colonoscopy. These are for screening and colonoscopies for diagnosis and treatment. What about CT colonography? Well, the sensitivity for adenomas greater than a centimeter or for carcinomas is about equivalent to colonoscopy. But the sensitivity for adenomas less than one centimeter is really not very good. You need a PrEP, the same for colonoscopy. There's radiation for, uh, for uh, CT colonography. And of course, they find extracolonic findings which are good. It does not afford polypectomy, it does not afford biopsy, and of course, there are reimbursement issues. In the United States, CT colonography is not reimbursed unless there is a failed colonoscopy. What about um, flexible sigmoidoscopy? Flexible sigmoidoscopy looks only at the left side of the colon, if at that. Uh, rigid sigmoidoscopy is just about finished with. Digital rectal examination is very important. So every physician should do a digital rectal examination to find those tumors that may be low down and uh, within reach of the index finger. But the flexible sigmoidoscopy uh, does not look at the right colon. The sensitivity for advanced adenomas is only 40%, and the proximal effect is minimal. So it can certainly not see or not discover polyps in the right side of the colon. The fecal cup blood test or the fecal immunochemical test uh, decreases mortality, it decreases incidence reduction, but the fact is that one needs sequential testing for it to be effective for either the, the GUIAC-based uh, fecal cup blood test or the fecal immunochemical test. What about the stool DNA test? Well, the stool DNA test is an interesting test. Uh, they have either 11 biomarkers or two biomarkers in some of these tests. Um, but the specificity, although high, the sensitivity is not very great. You need sequential testing and the cost is uh, rather expensive. So the, these don't seem to be available at the present time for worthwhile stool screening for DNA. Now, we mentioned before that if you, one does either DNA testing or fecal cult blood testing, you need to have sequential testing for it to be effective. And what about sequential testing? If we do a single colonoscopy and the adherence is about 86% for a single colonoscopy if it's suggested by the physician, unfortunately, the ability to track patients and have them come back for sequential fecal cup blood testing is about 40%. So it's not very effective for patients to do uh, fecal cup blood testing because uh, most patients do not come back for routine surveillance examinations. And it's very important to do that. What about the effectiveness of screening colonoscopy? Well, it's, uh, the colonoscopy is a high sensitivity for cancers and adenomas. It's cost effective in the long run. Interval cancers are relatively unusual if one does a high quality colonoscopy. The quality of colonoscopy does vary on whether a gastroenterologist does the examination or whether a non-gastroenterologist does the examination. And there is much literature to support the fact that gastroenterologists find more polyps, remove more polyps, and find more cancers than non-gastroenterologists. There are some cancers that are fast-growing fast cancers, and those are ones that uh, are the, the serrated adenoma, 
Um, and the serrated adenoma is uh, coming into importance now because it's thought that these are lesions that are quite readily missed and, uh, and not readily seen by, uh, by any of the, the, those who do colonoscopy. And the proximal versus distal effectiveness, uh, there are some, some studies that say that colonoscopy is not effective in the proximal colon, but it does increase, decrease the incidence of proximal disease by 56% versus 74% for the left colon. So it is effective, uh, not quite as effective for the right colon. And why doesn't colonoscopy protect against 100% uh, of colon cancers? It's because some polyps are small and can be missed. Uh, some large polyps are flat and may be missed. Some polyps are incompletely removed. Some tumors grow very rapidly. Uh, some cancers can be missed on colonoscopy. Some examinations may be incomplete. And of course, a poor preparation can obscure tumors. So I think we have multiple problems why colonoscopy may not be 100% effective in removing polyps and discovering these before they grow to be a colon cancers. Well, what about colonoscopy not protecting against right-sided cancers? Well, the colonoscopists may not reach the right colon. They may not recognize flat polyps. They may miss small polyps behind folds. They may incompletely remove polyps, or they may not be able to see them because of a poor preparation. And I think that uh, the preparation is the key to doing good colonoscopy. Uh, and right these days, most people suggest that we need a split dose preparation in order to effectively clean the right colon so that we can see that area better. And of course, procedures done by non-trained gastroenterologists uh, may miss uh, polyps in the right colon. But let's look at the breast cancer. The incidence of breast cancer over the years has really remained relatively steady. The incidence of breast cancer has not really decreased uh, in the United States. The mortality rate has decreased, and the mortality rate has decreased due to better surgery, due to better chemotherapy, better radiation treatment, but the mortality has decreased, although the rate has remained stable. Let's look at colon cancer. Look at the incidence of colon cancer, a marked decrease, considerably greater than breast cancer. The mortality has decreased as well, but the incidence is markedly down. And the incidence is markedly down because of colonoscopy. Colonoscopy really had a peak back here in the 1985, 1990s. And since then, by the use of colonoscopy and removing colon polyps, we've markedly decreased the incidence of, of uh, colon cancer in the United States. The mortality has decreased as well due to uh, better chemotherapy, better surgery, and... Um, uh, oncology. But if we look at the colon carcinoma increase uh, incidence, in the early years, less than age 50, the incidence is increasing. In the ages 50 to 64 years, the incidence is decreasing, and the incidence have markedly decreased in areas over 65. But if you look at the scale here, the incidence isn't really increasing a lot as compared to this. If we now look at put these in perspective, look at the difference in the, in the rate here. But if we use the same scale, this incidence for the, those aged less than 50 years is really down here in the incidence scale. What about uh, the decrease in, uh, the, in incidence in those that are in the age 50 to 60? And they're down here. So the incidence really is markedly decreased in the older ages when we see a lot more colonoscopy being used. If we look at uh, colorectal cancer mortality, of course, uh, that's a, I showed you earlier that the mortality rates are decreasing in both males and females due to better treatment and um, early diagnosis. What about colon carcinoma incidence by age? If you look at the United States population, very few carcinomas are seen less than age uh, 45. 
there are really very few. Most of them occur age 50 and beyond, and we have decreasing incidence in the older population, um, and a lot of these patients have had colonoscopy early on. What about new cases of colon cancer? Um, it, turned, it does turn out that uh, the countries that are richer have a much higher incidence of colon cancer than countries that are relatively poor or underdeveloped. Where does Greece fit into this uh, algorithm? Greece is way up here. Greece has a high life expectancy and it's a higher life expectancy than the United States. Let's cone in on this. Here's Greece. Greece has a higher life expectancy than the United States, uh, much higher than uh, China and these and other countries that are relatively underdeveloped. If we look at uh, this, the life expectancy in Greece is 80, the life expectancy in China is 73. So the life expectancy in Greece is uh, pretty good and it's also a, an area that's relatively rich. You guys may have your problems economically, but in general, Greece is one of the rich countries in the world. If we look at colon cancer deaths and incidents, though, if we look at Greece, it starts back in 1966. As Greece has uh, grown economically, uh, the colon cancer mortality has markedly increased as well. So the colon cancer is getting to be a bigger and bigger problem in Greece and there's, uh, it's up to us as physicians to do something about that and try to bring down that uh, increasing incidence of, um, of death. So look at the, uh, once again, this is the United States population as for colon cancer. Very few, less than age 50. If we look at the colon cancer in Sudan, however, notice that 40% of colon cancer in Sudan occur in age less than 50. Now, why does that happen? It happens because there's a tremendous genetic and environmental difference in the United States and Sudan. And here we see, when I was in the Sudan, they told me there were two peaks of colon cancer, one in the age 20s and one in the age 60s. So I was able to see young people, 23-year-old uh, men that had colon cancer, something we just don't see in the United States. But the fact is that these are different, different strokes, different folks. We cannot eliminate colon cancer if we can't find the cause of development of colon polyps. What about colon cancer incidence with the National Polyp Study? This is a group that, uh, that we started uh, back in the early 1990s, and we have a lot of results for uh, what happens for colon cancer. So if we take out all of the polyps, we find that uh, only five uh, cases here will have colon cancer because we removed all the, all the polyps. And this is our observed, the National Polyp Study observed. Um, the uh, a national database expected for this number of, uh, of patients uh, being followed for seven years, expected 21 uh, colon cancers. And if we look at what would expected from the Mayo Clinic data and from St. Mark's data, they were much, much higher than what we found by taking out colon polyps. So if we take out colon polyps, we markedly decrease colon cancer. We decrease it for 90% from, the, from these groups and 76% from what was expected from our national database, the SEER database. And uh, two years ago, our group uh, reported on colonoscopic polypectomy and long-term prevention of colon cancer deaths. You saw, this, um, you saw this algorithm before, and what's expected from the general population uh, was 25 deaths, and when we take out all the colon polyps, we find a marked decrease in deaths from colon cancer uh, in the long term. Colon polyps. However, 
Um, we look at the USA statistics. USA t statistics are uh, that the incidence about uh, 34 in males is 34 per 100,000, uh, 25 per 100,000 in females. Australia is much higher. It's one of the highest incidence of colon cancer in the world. But if we look at Greece, we see that uh, the colon cancer incidence has, the colon cancer deaths in Greece has increased over the years. But if you look at the incidence, the incidence is about half of that in the United States. But look at the death rate. The death rate is the same as the United States. So it indicates that if you're going to get colon cancer in Greece, there's a much higher rate of dying from colon cancer uh, than there is uh, in, in the United States. So it's an important cancer in Greece, and it's something that uh, you have to be aware of, and you have to realize that there are paths to prevent colon cancer. This is a, um, a statement that was made in uh, British Medical Journal on uh, gastroenterology uh, by Greek physicians. They say that we conclude that a huge work has to be done in Hellenic and more widely in European primary care setting if screening is to make a major impact on colorectal cancer mortality. They need uh, national guidelines imp implementation and continual medical education. So how realistic is the goal for elimination of colon cancer? We can find polyps by screening. We can remove them by colonoscopy. Colon cancer can be prevented and lives will be saved. Not every polyp is going to be found and removed. We don't know how to prevent polyps, unfortunately. There is nothing that we know at the present time that's going to prevent polyps from forming. Until that point is reached, colon cancer will not be eliminated. And it's by symposiums such as this that are going to increase the awareness of colon cancer, let us know how best to approach colon cancer, how we can prevent it, and hopefully, eventually, we can eliminate colon cancer. But right now, we don't know the key to preventing colon polyps, and when that key is found, we can then prevent and eliminate colon cancer. Thank you.